Section 2 of The Diary of John Evelyn, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. 22nd January, 1638. I would needs be admitted into the dancing and vaulting schools, of which late activity one Stokes the master did afterwards set forth a pretty book which was published with many witty elegies before it. 4th February 1638 One Mr. Warriner preached in our chapel, and on the 25th Mr. Wentworth, a kinsman of the Earl of Strafford, after which followed the Blessed Sacrament. 13th April 1638 my father ordered that I should begin to manage my own expenses, which till then my tutor had done, at which I was much satisfied. Portsmouth 9th July 1638 I went home to visit my friends, and on the 26th with my brother and sister to Lewis, where we abode till the 31st, and thence to one Mr. Michaels of Houghton near Arundel, where we were very well treated, and on the 2nd of August to Portsmouth, and thence, having surveyed the fortifications, a great rarity in that blessed house in time in England, we passed into the Isle of Wight, to the house of my Lady Richards, in a place called Yaviland, but were turned the following day to Chichester, where, having viewed the city and fair cathedral, we returned home. About the beginning of September, I was so afflicted with a court and ague that I could by no means get rid of it till the December following. This was the fatal year wherein the rebellious Scots opposed the King upon the pretence of the introduction of some new ceremonies and the Book of Common Prayer, and madly began our confusions and their own destruction too, as it proved in event. 14th January 1639 I came back to Oxford after my tedious indisposition and to the infinite loss of my time. And now I began to look upon the rudiments of music in which I afterward arrived to some formal knowledge though to small perfection of hand because I was so frequently diverted with inclinations to newer trifles. 20th May 1639 Accompanied with one Mr. J. Crafford, who afterward being my fellow traveller in Italy, there changed his religion, I took a journey of pleasure to see the Somersetshire Baths, Bristol, Sirencester, Malmesbury, Abingdon, and divers other towns of lesser note, and returned the 25th. 8th October 1639. I went back to Oxford. 14th December 1639. According to injunctions from the heads of colleges, I went, among the rest, to the confirmation at St Mary's, where, after sermon, the Bishop of Oxford laid his hands upon us with the usual form of benediction prescribed. But this received, I fear, for the more part out of curiosity, rather than with that due preparation and advice which had been requisite, could not be so effectual as otherwise that admirable and useful institution might have been and as I have since deplored it. 21st January 1640 Came my brother Richard from school to be my chamber fellow at the university. He was admitted the next day and matriculated the 31st. London 11th April 1640 I went to London to see the solemnity of His Majesty's riding through the city in state to the short Parliament which began the 13th following. A very glorious and magnificent sight. The king circled with his royal diadem and the affections of his people. But the day after I returned to Watton again, where I stayed, my father's indisposition, suffering great intervals, till April 27th, when I was sent to London to be first resident at the Middle Temple, so as my being at the university, in regard of these avocations, was a very small benefit to me. Upon May the 5th following was the Parliament unhappily dissolved, 
and on the 20th I returned with my brother George to Watton, who, on the 28th of the same month, was married at Albury to Mrs. Caldwell, an heiress of an ancient Leicestershire family, where part of the nuptials was celebrated. 10th June 1640. I repaired with my brother to the term to go into our new lodgings, that were formerly in Essex Court, being a very handsome apartment just over against the hall court, but four pair of stairs high, which gave us the advantage of the fairer prospect, but did not much contribute to the love of that impolished study, to which, I suppose, my father had designed me when he paid £145 to purchase our present lives and assignments afterward. London, and especially the court, were at this period in frequent disorders, and great insolences were committed by the abused and too happy city. In particular, the Bishop of Canterbury's palace at Lambeth was assaulted by a rude rabble from Southwark, my Lord Chamberlain imprisoned, and many scandalous libels and invectives scattered about the streets to the reproach of government and the fermentation of our since distractions. So that upon the 25th of June I was sent for to Watton, and the 27th after, my father's indisposition augmenting, by advice of the physicians, he repaired to the bath. 7th July 1640 my brother George and I, understanding the peril my father was in upon a sudden attack of his infirmity, rode post from Guildford toward him, and found him extraordinarily weak. Yet so as that, continuing his course, he held out till the 8th of September, when I returned with him in his litter. 15th October 1640. I went to the temple, it being Michaelmas term. 30th December 1640. I saw His Majesty, coming from his northern expedition, ride in pomp and a kind of ovation, with all the marks of a happy peace, restored to the affections of his people, being conducted through London with the most splendid cavalcade. And on the 3rd of November, following, a day never to be mentioned without a curse, to that long, ungrateful, foolish and fatal Parliament, the beginning of all our sorrows for twenty years after, and the period of the most happy monarch in the world, Quistalia Fando. But my father, being by this time entered into a dropsy, an indisposition the most unsuspected, being a person so exemplary temperate and of admirable regimen, hastened me back to Watton, December the 12th, where, the 24th following, between twelve and one o'clock at noon, departed this life, that excellent man and indulgent parent, retaining his senses and piety to the last, which he most tenderly expressed in blessing us, whom he now left to the world and the worst of times, while he was taken from the evil to come. 1641. It was a sad and lugubrious beginning of the year, when on the 2nd of January, 1640-1, to we at night followed the morning hearse to the church at Watton, when, after a sermon and funeral oration by the minister, my father was interred near his formerly erected monument, and mingled with the ashes of our mother, his dear wife. Thus we were bereft of both our parents in a period when we most of all stood in need of their counsel and assistance, especially myself, of a raw, vain, uncertain, and very unwary inclination. But so it pleased God to make trial of my conduct in a conjuncture of the greatest and most prodigious hazard that ever the youth of England saw. And if I did not amidst all this impeach my liberty nor my virtue with the rest who made shipwreck of both, it was more the infinite goodness and mercy of God than the least providence or discretion of mine own, who now thought of nothing but the pursuit of vanity and the confused imaginations of young men. 15th April 1641 I repaired to London to hear and see the famous trial of the Earl of Strafford, Lord Deputy of Ireland, 
who on the 22nd of March had been summoned before both Houses of Parliament and now appeared in Westminster Hall, which was prepared with scaffolds for the Lords and Commons, who, together with the King, Queen, Prince and Flower of the Noblesse, were spectators and auditors of the greatest malice and the greatest innocency that ever met before so illustrious an assembly. It was Thomas Earl of Arundel and Surrey Earl Marshal of Kingland who was made High Steward upon this occasion, and the sequel is too well known to need any notice of the event. On the 27th of April came over out of Holland the young Prince of Orange with a splendid equipage to make love to His Majesty's eldest daughter, the now Princess Royal. That evening was celebrated the pompous funeral of the Duke of Richmond, who was carried in effigy, with all the ensigns of that illustrious family, in an open chariot, in great solemnity, through London to Westminster Abbey. On the 12th of May, I beheld on Tower Hill the fatal stroke which severed the wisest head in England from the shoulders of the Earl of Strafford whose crime coming under the cognizance of no human law or statute, a new one was made not to be a precedent, but his destruction. With what reluctancy the king signed the execution, he has sufficiently expressed, to which he imputes his own unjust suffering, to such exorbitancy were things arrived. On the 24th of May I returned to Watton, and on the 28th of June, I went to London with my sister Jane, and the day after sat to one von der Borscht for my picture in oil at Arundel House, whose servant that excellent painter was, brought out of Germany when the Earl, returned from Vienna, with he was sent ambassador extraordinary, with great pomp and charge, though without any effect, through the artifice of the Jesuited Spaniard who governed all in that conjuncture. With van der Borscht, the painter, he brought over Wenceslas Holler, the sculptor, who engraved not only the unhappy deputy's trial in Westminster Hall, but his decapitation, as he did several other historical things, then relating to the accidents happening during the rebellion in England with great skill, besides many cities, towns and landscapes, not only of this nation, but of foreign parts, and diverse portraits of famous persons then in being, and things designed from the best pieces of the rare paintings and masters of which the Earl of Arundel was possessor, purchased and collected in his travels with incredible expense. So as, though hollers were but etched in Arquafortis, I account the collection to be the most authentic and useful extant. Holler was the son of a gentleman near Prague in Bohemia, and my very good friend, perverted at last by the Jesuits at Antwerp to change his religion. A very honest, simple, well-meaning man, who at last came over again into England, where he died. We have the whole history of the King's reign, from his trial in Westminster Hall and before, to the restoration of King Charles II, represented in several sculptures, with that also of Archbishop Lord, by this indefatigable artist, besides innumerable sculptures in the works of Dugdale, Ashmole, and other historical and useful works. I am the more particular upon this for the fruit of that collection, which I wish I had entire. This picture I presented to my sister, being at her request, on my resolution to absent myself from this ill face of things at home, which gave umbrage to wiser than myself, that the medal was reversing, and our calamities but yet in their infancy. So that, on the 15th of July, having procured a pass at the Custom House, where I repeated my oath of allegiance, I went from London to Gravesend, accompanied with one Mr. Carroll, a Surrey gentleman, and our servants, where we arrived by six o'clock that evening, with a purpose to take the first opportunity of a passage for Holland. But the wind as yet not favourable, we had time to view the blockhouse of that town, which answered to another over against it at Tilbury, famous for the rendezvous of Queen Elizabeth in the year 1588, which we found stored with twenty pieces of cannon 
and other ammunition proportionable. On the 19th of July we made a short excursion to Rochester and having seen the cathedral went to Chatham to see the Royal Sovereign, a glorious vessel of burden lately built there, being for defence and ornament the richest that ever spread cloth before the wind. She carried an hundred brass cannon and was 1,200 tons. A rare sailor, the work of the famous Phineas Pett, inventor of the frigate fashion of building, to this day practised. But what is to be deplored as to this vessel is that it cost His Majesty the affections of his subjects, perverted by the malcontent of great ones, who took occasion to quarrel for his having raised a very slight tax for the building of this and equipping the rest of the navy without an act of parliament, though by the suffrages of the major part of the judges the king might legally do in times of imminent danger of which his majesty was best apprised. But this not satisfying a jealous party, it was condemned as unprecedented and not justifiable as to the royal prerogative, and accordingly the judges were removed out of their places, fined and imprisoned. We returned again this evening, and on the 21st of July embarked in a Dutch frigate bound for Flushing, convoyed and accompanied by five other stout vessels, whereof one was a man of war. The next day at noon we landed at Flushing. De Vere. Being desirous to overtake the Ligia, which was then before Genep, ere the summer should be too far spent, we went this evening from Flushing to Middleburg, another fine town in this island, to De Vere, went to the most ancient and illustrious earls of Oxford derive their family, who have spent so much blood in assisting the state during their wars. From De Vere we passed over many towns, houses and ruins of demolished suburbs, etc., which have formerly been swallowed up by the sea, at what time no less than eight of those islands had been irrecoverably lost. The next day we arrived at Dort, the first town of Holland, furnished with all German commodities and especially Rhenish wines and timber. It hath almost at the extremity a very spacious and venerable church, a stately senate house wherein was holden that famous synod against the Arminians in 1618, and in that hall hangeth a picture of the Passion, an exceeding rare and much esteemed piece. From Dort, being desirous to hasten toward the army, I took wagon this afternoon to Rotterdam, whither we were hurried in less than an hour, though it be ten miles distant. So furiously do those foremen drive. I went first to visit the great church, the Dool, the Bourse, and the public statue of the learned Erasmus of Brass. They showed us his house, or rather the mean cottage wherein he was born, over which there are extant these lines in capital letters, Edibus his autus mundum decoravit Erasmus artibus ingenio legione fide. The 26th of July I passed by a straight and commodious river through Delft to the Hague, in which journey I observed diverse leprous poor creatures dwelling in solitary huts on the brink of the water, and permitted to ask the charity of passengers, which is conveyed to them in a floating box that they cast out. Arrived at the Hague, I went first to the Queen of Bohemia's court, where I had the honour to kiss Her Majesty's hand and several of the princesses, her daughters. Prince Maurice was also there, newly come out of Germany, and my Lord Finch, not long before, fled out of England from the fury of the Parliament. It was a fasting day with the Queen for the unfortunate death of her husband, and the present chamber had been hung with black velvet ever since his decease. Nijmegen The 28th of July I went to Leiden, and the 29th to Utrecht, being thirty English miles distant, as they reckon by hours. It was now Kermus, or a fair in this town. 
the streets swarming with boars and rudeness, so that early the next morning, having visited the ancient bishop's court and the two famous churches, I satisfied my curiosity to my return and better leisure. We then came to Rhinon, where the Queen of Bohemia hath a neat and well-built palace or country house, after the Italian manner, as I remember. And so, crossing the Rhine upon which this villa is situated, lodged that night in a countryman's house. The 31st to Nijmegen, and on the 2nd of August we arrived at the Ligure, where was then the whole army encamped about Genep, a very strong castle situated on the river Val. But being taken four or five days before, we had only a sight of the demolitions. The next Sunday was the thanksgiving sermons performed in Colonel Goring's regiment, eldest son of the since Earl of Norwich, by Mr Goff, his chaplain, now turned Roman and father confessor to the Queen Mother. The evening was spent in firing cannon and other expressions of military triumphs. Now, according to the compliment, I was received a volunteer in the company of Captain Apsley, of whose Captain Lieutenant Honeywood, Apsley being absent, I received many civilities. The 3rd of August, at night, we rode about the lines of circumvallation, the general being then in the field. The next day I was accommodated with a very spacious and commodious tent for my lodging. As before, I was with a horse, which I had at command, and a hut which during the excessive heats was a great convenience. For the sun piercing the canvas of the tent, it was during the day unsufferable, and at night not seldom infested with mists and fogs which ascended from the river. 6th August 1641 As the turn came about, we were ordered to watch on a hornwork near our quarters, and trail a pike, being the next morning relieved by a company of French. This was our continual duty till the castle was refortified, and all danger of quitting that station secured. Whence I went to see a convent of Franciscan friars, not far from our quarters, where we found both the chapel and refectory full, crowded with the goods of such poor people as at the approach of the army had fled with them thither for sanctuary. On the day following I went to view all the trenches, approaches and mines, etc., of the besiegers, and in particular I took special notice of the wheel bridge, which engine his excellently he had made to run over the moat when they stormed the castle. As it is since described, with all the other particulars of this siege, and by the author of that incomparable work, Hollandia Illustrata, the walls and ramparts of earth, which a mine had broken and crumbled, were of prodigious thickness. Upon the 8th of August I dined in the horse quarters with Sir Robert Stone and his lady, Sir William Stradling, and divers cavaliers, where there was very good cheer but hot service for a young drinker, as then I was, so that, being pretty well satisfied with the confusion of armies and sieges, if such that of the United Provinces may be called, where their quarters and encampments are so admirably regular and orders so exactly observed as few cities, the best governed in time of peace, exceed it for all conveniences. I took my leave of the Ligure and Camarade, and on the 12th of August I embarked on the Val, in company with three grave divines who entertained us a great part of our passage with a long dispute concerning the lawfulness of church music. We now sail by tile where we landed some of our freight, and about five o'clock we touched at a pretty town named Bommel that had diverse English in garrison. It stands upon contribution land, which subjects the environs to the Spanish incursions. We sailed also by an exceeding strong fort called Loverstein, famous for the escape of the learned Hugo Grotius, who being in durance as a capital offender, as was the unhappy Barnefeld by the stratagem of his lady, was conveyed in a trunk supposed to be filled with books only. We lay at Gorkum, a very strong and considerable frontier. 
13th August 1641. We arrived late at Rotterdam, where was their annual mart or fair, so furnished with pictures, especially landscapes and drolleries, as they call those clownish representations, that I was amazed. Some of these I bought and sent into England. The reason of this store of pictures and their cheapness proceeds from their want of land to employ their stock, so that it is an ordinary thing to find a common farmer lay out two or three thousand pounds in this commodity. Their houses are full of them, and they vend them at their fairs to very great gains. Here I first saw an elephant, who was extremely well disciplined and obedient. It was a beast of a monstrous size, yet as flexible and nimble in the joints, contrary to the vulgar tradition, as could be imagined from so prodigious a bulk and strange fabric. But I most of all admired the dexterity and strength of its proboscis, on which it was able to support two or three men, and by which it took and reached whatever was offered to it. Its teeth were but short, being a female, and not old. I was also shown a pelican, or onocratulas, of Pliny, with its large gullets, in which he kept his reserve of fish. The plumage was white, legs red, flat, and filmed-footed. Likewise a cock with four legs, two rumps, and vents. Also a hen, which had two large spurs growing out of her sides, penetrating the feathers of her wings. 17th August 1641, I passed again through Delft and visited the church in which was the monument of Prince William of Nassau, the first of the Williams, and saviour, as they call him, of their liberty, which cost him his life by a vile assassination. It is a piece of rare art, consisting of several figures as big as the life in copper, there is in the same place a magnificent tomb of his son and successor Morris. The Senate House hath a very stately portico, supported with choice columns of black marble, as I remember, of one entire stone. Within there hangs a weighty vessel of wood, not unlike a butter churn, which the adventurous woman that hath two husbands at one time is to wear on her shoulders, her head peeping out at the top only and so led about the town as a penance for her incontinence. From hence we went the next day to Ryswick, a stately country house of the Prince of Orange, for nothing more remarkable than the delicious walks planted with lime trees and the modern paintings within. End of section 2